welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I'm Jesse De La Cruz. I'm the co-founder of Art Hive and creative executive director by night and by day. I'm the music and recorded sound archivist and assistant director of the American Music Research Center at University of Colorado Boulder. And I'm Sigri Strand. I'm the co-founder of Art Hive and deputy director by night. And during the day, I'm the development director at Historic Temper. Um, we want to thank Cipriano Ortega, who approached us about leading this Record to Record program. We think of Record to Record as a book club albums. At Art Hive, we often ask our artists what albums have inspired them, because we want to understand inspiration on every level. This month, we're doing Morphine's Cure for Pain, featuring Dana Colley and Jerome Dupree of Morphine. We're huge fans. Uh, this is an album that I revisit often, and I know Jesse also loves them. Um, we're also welcoming local musicians Cipriano Ortega and Vitali Minielo. So with that, we want to introduce Bruce Trujillo, our amazing host, and she will give some more uh, introductions. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks, Jesse and Sigri. Uh, so the album Cure for Pain from Morphine was released in September of 1993 and has since grown into a 90s alternative rock favorite. And you're all here. You totally understand that. Songs from the album have been included in film and TV, which is how Denver Cipriano Ortega was introduced to it. It's inclusion in season one of The Sopranos. It's inspired him and his music. So tonight I'll be speaking with Cipriano and his collaborator, Vitaly Mignolo and Dana Coley and Jermaine Dupri of Morphine, no big deal. Uh, some themes that we're gonna be going over tonight include the instrumentation and arrangement of the album and the sounds that Morphine elicits through these and how minimally they can do so. Cipriano, let me just ask you right off, what drew you to this album? Well, like you said, I mean, the first time I was introduced, I remember I was winding it into the Sopranos cause I like, you know, mafioso stuff, you know, like Goodfellas and et cetera. And I was watching one episode and then the opening track came on, which isn't the usual song. And I heard this song and I was just like, what is this? It just stirred something in me that uh, was familiar, but also very foreign. And um, I researched it and um, it was Buena. And that was the first song that I was introduced to Morphine with. And even before that, I was getting into more understanding bass frequencies and lower register, because I always played guitar and dabbled in you know, um, piano and such, but I always was attracted to the bass. And then when I discovered that uh, it was a bass, but not only just a bass, but a two string bass, but not only that, a two string slide bass, I had felt like um, it was something that uh, I needed to understand more and more of. So that's kind of somewhat in a nutshell how it all began. And uh, I'm amazed that I'm so grateful to be here and to be discovering morphine um, over and over by every time I, I listen to it. So Well, and grateful that Dana and Jerome are here with us. So I actually want to direct the conversation to you guys really quick. Tell us a little bit more about the um, the basic instrumentation and arrangement of getting this album recorded. Maybe take us to the studios as you guys were recording Cure for Pain. Jerome, you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you want me to, so I will. <laughs> um, while we were at Fort Apache Studios, which uh, was a place I had actually recorded before. It was above Rounder Records. Um, so I'd actually been in the room before, but it had been taken over by friends of ours who ran the Fort, Apa Fort Apache brand, if you will. That was their their new location. Um, but I took in the gear that I'd been playing on the road, um, which was a little bit more of a standard drum set than I'd used on the previous album. Um, so there were more cymbals. Um, it was just a more conventional sounding kit. But we had just come back from touring on the West Coast back in the day when you could actually get a drum set on a plane. You know, those were the drums I took. So, but you know, Paul Coldry did a great job of getting set up. You know, we went in and got set up and we're getting sounds pretty quick. And I think. I mean, I'd, you'd have to ask Paul, but my recollection is that most of what you're hearing on the album was all done at the same time. I mean, Mark might have redone vocals, but he was singing. We were all playing and he was singing when we recorded. And I want to say that that's the majority of the basis of every track, but I don't know for sure. I did my stuff and left and the record was done after I'd left the band. So I basically just went in for a couple of days and it took me to lay everything down. 
and then I split. I wasn't around for anything else. What happened next would be more to Dana's memory, but it was Port Apache and all set up in the same room, uh, except for, I guess, Mark was in a booth. Um, I don't know where his amp was, but he was in a booth so he could be isolated singing. We were basically playing live is how I remember it. Yeah, I think the live uh, element of the takes was very important uh, to getting a good basic track. And we were pretty honed as a band by that point. As Jerome mentioned, we had just come back from a, a California tour. And uh, the band had, it had always recorded pretty much from the start of its inception. So the idea of like keeping songs uh, fresh while they were happening, while they were feeling energetic and getting them into the studio was important. I don't know if what we knew what we were doing it was where it was going at the time, but it um, it was part of the process to always record. And our nucle nucleus of Mark on two string slide bass, which initially started as a one string, Jerome on drums and myself on baritone saxophone, you know, that was that was the core band. And even though Jerome said that he split his his uh, influence in the in the in the sound of morphine uh, carried forward in terms of uh, his imprint and what he brought to the band. And uh, Billy Conway and he drummed both very close. And Billy was able to kind of, because of their friendship and because of their relationship, they were very open to sharing, you know, their processes and their ideas. And Billy picked up the torch for, essentially from Jerome and, and carried that forward. But, uh, you know, Dr Billy's playing and Jerome's playing are, are very much informed in one another. Well, and you mentioned the, the nucleus of the band just being you three. Would you consider yourselves like a, a minimalist type of band? Just kind of, these are the bare bones and this is what we're moving forward with. Would that be an accurate statement? Yeah, I think that was kind of the the idea of, uh, you know, to be as stripped down as possible, you know, to kind of use as simple elements and leaving room for space and uh, to, to have a place and to allow the imagination also to kind of pick up where where maybe space is, is allows for that, you know, where a listener can kind of fill in the fill in the, the space themselves with their own imagination. You know, like we always said that we had, we didn't have guitar, we sort of implied guitar. Uh, although there is guitar on, on, even on Cure for Pain, you, you can hear it, but uh, it wasn't part of the core sound, the core basic track. If you get back to the actual making of the record that most of the songs were constructed from that core element. And the live take was very important. I, I'm pretty sure that Mark might have gone back and done his vocals again, but the elements of uh, that live performance, I think, is what made a take a take. Right. I'm not sure I've answered that, but I, in terms of the minimalist question, I, I, I would say that it was very much part of our philosophy and, and ethos. Uh, in fact, my I think my my if you're asking me what my favorite performance of myself on the record would be, I think the best job I did on the record was on Spite of Me, in fact, where I didn't play at all. So talk talk about minimalism. Super stripped down. Yeah, just like. Just sit out, you know. Well, and we've been we've mentioned the two string slide bass a couple of times here, used by Mark on this album. Cipriana, you have mentioned that not only the the two string slide really has inspired you, you've made a couple of your own, but mm -hmm. also this minimalist sound kind of influencing how you make your music. You're kind of introduced to it through morphine. So tell me a little bit more specifically about the two string slide bass. What about that? sound caught your attention? I think for me, I mean, even before I discovered the, the two-string bass, a little bit backtracking to somewhat um, to what Dana was saying and having the audience fill in the blanks. We worked on another piece, you know, that we called Jizz Jazz that we're still in development with. And my, my drummer and, and um, co-producer here, Vitalik, said that, you know, it, the reason why we leave so much space is because we want people to fill in the blanks. And then once I heard you know, Morphine make that remark and Dana make that remark and I've watched their documentaries and then Vitaly to say that it kind of clicked. And so going to the two string slide bass itself is I've always been attracted to the slide sound. And um, it can be rather challenging to play a six string or, you know, you know, even a four string bass. Um, but the sonic quality and the minimalist approach with even the first iteration of the bass that Mark designed, which was the single string bass, was something that attracted me because it, it seemed very approachable to me. It seemed like, okay, there's one string or there's two strings, let's see what I can do with that. And to go even into further of the sonic qualities of the bass itself, I always have strived for, for soundscapes that are kind of darker or moodier. We very much enjoy things that elude 
a certain mystique with them. And I think with Mark developing that instrument, that it, it's just exactly what I need for this project and for other things I've worked on. It's just, it fits so well because it's, um, it just, it sounds the way, if I could be an instrument, that's the instrument I'd choose to be because it has this, this moodiness and this melodic darkness to it that isn't necessarily negative because I don't want to say that it is dark or negative. It's just, it, it, it holds you. It kind of just, it, it embraces you and it allows you to do so much melodically with it, with vocals and with other things as well too. It's a great foundation for um, a lot of the compositions that we work on, so. And Jerome and Dana, if you can talk a little bit more about what was your reaction to that two string bass the first time it was played within the band? Was it something that it was like, did Mark just bring in and be like, all right, I'm going to play this two string, one string bass and let's see what we can do with it. Tell me a little bit more about that introduction. Well, <clears throat> most people probably know the story, but it, Mark and I uh, became friends after his first band, Treat Her Right, um, were playing uh, a, a gig at the Rat Skeller in Boston band I was in, Three Colors, was playing the same bill. And that's the first time I had heard Mark. He was in a band called Sandman, actually, not not Treater Wright. Uh, we became friends. And then I think soon after that, he formed Treater Wright. And then Treater Wright, how long did Treater Wright go for, Jerome? Five years. Five years. Wow. I think they, yeah, I think when they did the, the fifth anniversary at the channel, then it wasn't too long after that that everything, you know, they were headed out to... Austin and everything went south. So in the band Treater Right, Mark was playing a six string guitar, but he was only using two strings and he was using an octaver to get a bass tone, uh, which was really innovative and, and unique sound in itself. So right from the start, Mark was working on, on sort of minimalizing the, the bass and his w style of playing bass with Tree to Right was, was, was really incredible because you if you could almost not even think about the bass, but it was always present. He would play through a large SVT, uh, which is a huge amp that just is just powerful. It sends a bass frequency that is just goes right through your body. And Mark would play the most simplest of lines as and nothing that would, you know, get anyone's attention necessarily, but it was perfect for what they were doing. It was perfect for the song and his tonality and his placement and, and his ability to sing on top of it uh, was really amazing to see and, and it really struck me as, as, as uh, really appropriate in terms of his musicality and what was required for, for, the, for the song and for the role of the bass. So it was kind of no surprise when Mark, you know, later invited me to his apartment to, and said, bring your baritone, I'm working on this new instrument, I want to see how it sounds together and we he had his one string at that point and I can remember it was a place in Cambridge um, and we I came up with my horn and he plugged in his one string and we just kind of started jamming you know we didn't really talk much we just started playing music and it was immediate we found uh, the range was very compatible between the baritone my low uh, my low would be on the saxophone it would be a low B and a concert C was the low string he used, a concert D, uh, I'm sorry, concert D, it would be, it was his open string. And so for me, that was like almost the lowest note on my horn. So immediately we had that root uh, covered. Uh, and then with his voice, he formed another third on top of that. So it was kind of this, one of those moments where it's like, well, I think, well, this sounds good. This, this could work. And, you know, I thought it sounded good. But Mark, I think the light bulb went on his head uh, that it would that he could really um, exploit the whole sound uh, and 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 make something of it. Well, and this uh, it gets me thinking for for both the Cipriano and for morphine in your music. If you have something that's something that stripped down, so to speak, um, what do you decide to put in and what do you decide to leave out, especially with the ethos of being minimalist? Um, Cipriano, I'll let you start and then we'll go to morphine. For me, com composing music, I, I don't go into it with an intention. I mean, it's I, I do identify obviously with the, you know, the title minimalist, but um, that's a good question. Um, I think another reason why I like the two string bass and the bass itself is like, I see building a song or composing a song kind of like, um, architect, you know, you're 
the bass frequency and the drums are kind of the foundation and the walls are maybe the you know whatever melodic instruments that you add to that either be saxophone or piano and the vocals go on top so it formulates this this approach so for me um, with that minimalist idea adding in things for me and for us is just to emphasize what's already there so whatever the bass line's doing or whatever the vocals are doing I think Mark as well said this as well too is he wanted it and I wanted to emphasize the vocals because for both of us we believe if there's going to be vocals in a song they should be important they should be heard and the instrumentation should lend itself to that and I think the reason why I like the two string bass so much is it like I said before is it leaves so much room for me to play around with it's not so much minimalist it's almost it's liberation and with Mark developing this innovative and inventing this innovative um, instrument it just allowed me to because finally make that connection because I like I said before I, I played instruments before and I played guitar for many years but I just never felt a drive to do it and then when I discovered this instrument I wake up every day and I play it every day it's one of the most exciting things I've ever discovered quite frankly in my musical endeavors and probably in my life so far so <laughs> so yeah and Jerome, Welcome to the club. To be, <laughs> glad to be part of it. <laughs> well, for me, I remember getting a call from Mark. I I was a big fan of Trudor Wright. Um, that was when I first met him. Um, although I think a band I had been in earlier, had, uh, he had opened up for us, you know, with Sandman. So I may have seen him at some point, but I don't I don't remember him. But anyway, he called me and said Dana and he were playing, and he had this new sound and would I want to do it? And I said, sure. So we met up at my re uh, rehearsal studio, which at the time was in Everett and uh, just started playing, like Dana said. And yeah, there was immediately, you know, a vibe. And I think Mark might've had a couple of tunes. Um, Dana had one song and we just sort of went over that. And, you know, for me, my approach was minimal in the sense that I had played with Mark previous uh, in a band called Hypnosonics. And uh, in that band, I literally just used bass drum and snare drum. Um, Mark didn't want any cymbals and uh, Jay Hilt, the drummer who was originally in the band, had just used that and a block of wood to play on. And um, so I had been coming from that. So I knew, you know, regular drums weren't gonna work. Mark probably wouldn't want it. So I think even in that first session, I either took the cymbals down or just stayed away from them. And so I wound up with a, you know, the setup on good was basically kick, snare, hat, floor tom, and two tiny little cymbals. Um, like I say, cure for pain, by the time that came around, I was playing more of a conventional set. But, um, you know, in the beginning it was, I just knew it was Mark. You know, he created the instrument and it had this sound and I kind of knew what he wanted. So that's what I did. I'm also particularly interested. I, I play bass myself and um, not in a minimalist sort of way, but knowing that the bass and the drums have a specific relationship to each other. You, the bassist and the drummer kind of have to be in tune and sync with each other most times. So Vitaly and Jerome, can you talk about you, uh, working with a, a bass in this way that's not necessarily doing any sort of like it's not doing like the what a four string bass is doing it's not doing what a six string five string or six string bass is how do you how do you work off of that and how do you kind of discover what your line is going to be within a song and Vitaly we haven't heard from you yet so I'll let you go first oh uh, okay well my background is actually uh, like really really busy music really complicated music that's kind of like where I come from. So for me, it's actually a challenge to step back and complement the song and like focus on what it needs. So for me, it's actually interesting because I have to like be mindful of it. And um, yeah, like that's the part that I like, that it's not like, just going crazy. Um, yeah, that's all I really could say. Yeah. Yeah, something a little bit different. And what about you, Jerome? Working with a, a a bass with only two strings, it's not necessarily going up and down the neck. 
I think it was, you know, for me, it was still just about a groove. Um, you know, I understood that the drums could operate sort of in a different way. You know, I kind of had to be the framework that those two other guys were going off of. But the fact that it was slide, you know, rhythmically meant everything could be sort of loosey-goosey and that was fun. I mean, it, it uh, in some ways, it brought together all, you know, I like a really wide range of music and it's always hard to find one situation where you can do all of that. And Morphine in the beginning was probably about as close as I've ever gotten. I mean, it had, I was using brushes on some tunes. Some tunes had a straight ahead swing feel. There was hard rock, there was, you know, everything. And so in that sense, it was the, it was a really, you know, fun thing for me to do. But yeah, playing with Mark, it was just all about trying to get a groove going. Um, Mm, right. And this, it kind of touches on um, the idea of primitive sounds and Cipriano when we were kind of getting ready to put this together, you had mentioned that. Um, so expand on the idea of these primitive sounds using a two string bass and stripped down sort of um, instrumentation on either of these uh, band lineups and uh, arrangements. Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, primitive has always kind of had a double edged meaning to me. and. Um, just from coming from an indigenous background of being of an indigenous um, just person, um, you know, it, it almost seems like it's it's basic or it's simple or it's something that is easy, you know. And I come from, you know, my background is Apache and Spanish, and you know, with with native drums, um, I don't want to sound like an expert expert, but from what I've observed and what from what I've played with and seen, is it is this constant pulse. You know, and so this pulsation happening throughout the song, it kind of, you know, holds that. And Jerome, you do a wonderful job in both of those albums to, like like you said, is holding down that framework. And you can hear it because even in live versions, you, you I can see Mark sometimes just cuts out completely and stops playing. And the, the framework is still there. And that's something that intrigued me so much is that the drums definitely keep time and they definitely keep pace but they also are in dialogue with everything else, but at the same time, still keeping everything in time. And that's what both of you do so well. And that's what's so amazing about it. And yeah, going back to um, the two string and the primitive concept, um, there are many world, you know, instruments that are two or three stringed. You know, there's Japanese and Chinese and African instruments as well too. And just to have for me, like I like the number three or like the number two, just to have those options, like I said, never feels limiting. It's just like, well, this is what we have. And um, it's just fun. And again, going to Jerome was saying about the slide itself, it does make it sound very loose. So there's a way to play with that too. And I think Dana and Jerome do a fantastic job with complimenting Mark in Cure for Pain and just allowing that, that liberation because it feels so liberating compared to a lot of the sounds not to, you know, dog anything from the 90s. I love the 90s. That's where I pull a lot of inspiration from. But morphine in itself is so different in that sense. And it always will be, I think, because of the, all those factors. So, you know. Could I jump in uh, just to, to kind of follow up on the primitive idea? Mm -hmm. uh, I think Mark was really influenced with the uh, idea of the unitar, which is goes way goes back to like, uh, you know, southern uh, roots and where people would take a single string, maybe from a piano even, and um, nail it to the to the porch, to the porch pillar, uh, and uh, and with a bridge, and and would you know some of that early house rocking stuff, literally was house rocking because it was using the house to to play and to as part of an instrument, and the string would be part of that of that house and that sound is, is has a long history of, of uh, using a slide and just one string like like Cipriano was talking about. Well, and this um, this kind of touches base then on some sonic influences. And I'd like to hear from everybody on this particularly because we can we can mention like more indigenous sounds and how wide ranging those can be the heartbeat and uh, that kind of a thing with the drums, but also you're talking about this like Southern influence of um, like going back to um, American roots and all that good stuff. So tell me, uh, 
Morphine, Dana and Jerome, what are some sonic influences for you guys? What were they going into this album? And then we can, of course, talk about some now. But what were you guys looking at, you know, back in the early 90s as sonic influences, things that you wanted to explore, especially in this uh, frame of having more of a minimal sound? I, think I, just, I want Jerome to answer that. But before I do, I just would like to make the point that James Mobius from Brookline, Massachusetts makes that Mark uh, had said that each string has all the notes. So the idea of one string has all the notes. So there's what what purpose would there be for any more than that? Except, of course, if you add the second string for power chords. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I also knew that if you broke a string, you were yeah. screwed. Got to back up. <laughs> yeah, that, that does happen with these sometimes. <laughs> yeah, if you broke a string on stage, you had nowhere to go. So he yeah, got that's like, why I built two, because I have a backup. <laughs> That's when we went inside my brain. Mm -hmm. Sonically, I, yeah. boy, it's tough. I think um, I was just always reacting to the sounds that were around me. I didn't go into morphine with thinking, oh, this is what I want to do. I know on good, um, you know, the drums were a lot more muffled and I was playing with things that weren't sticks. They were sort of halfway between a brush and a stick and what it ended up doing, I, you know, I had the snares off and I'm sort of a frustrated hand drummer. And so in the end, I realized that some of that setup almost sounds, it's as close as I can get to playing a kunga. Um, and it wasn't my intention, but that's kind of where it ended up. Um, so that was one thing that, you know, that carried over. But uh, another thing in terms of you're talking about instrumental roles. Um, I was a big fan of The Police. Um, and that's definitely a band where, you know, drums and guitar and bass switch roles, you know, that they normally would do. Um, and Stuart Copeland obviously had a lot of really fresh approaches. You know, again, I wasn't necessarily conscious of that in terms of, oh, I'm going to use that. But I listen to a really wide range of music and it's all it's all up for grabs, you know, um, when I get inspired. So I don't think of, oh, yeah, this was what I wanted to do with this project. It was just what happened. But you're listening, what you're listening to has, has really influenced your, your, you know, your styles, Art Blakey, you know, it's certainly you can hear, hear Elvin Jones, you know, guys like that who Jerome listens to and listen to very intently and you can hear hear those influences even, you know, crossing over into morphine. I grew up with, you know, British Invasion and American pop and, you know, really wide range of music. It was all coming out of the same radio. You know, AM radio in the early 60s was really something else. And, you know, I don't, I thank God. I mean, it was a really great time to be, you know, growing up and playing music. And so that just sort of stayed with me. I've always, listen to a wide, wide range of stuff. I got into the jazz a little bit later, but uh, yeah, you know, it, it's all, it's all there in some way. You know. All that influence. All right, Cipriano, who, who are some of your sonic influences outside of morphine mm -hmm. um, that maybe you would want to share and that kind of influence what you do in your music? I think one of the biggest ones, and there's, there's many, but the one that comes to mind um, first and foremost is the doors. And the, the reason why is because, um, Another thing, another reason why I like Cure for Pain and Morphine in general is because they combine the beat poets and poetry in general. And, you know, I, I started doing poetry when I was very, very young, and I didn't make the connection so much until I was older, realizing that they can be intertwined. And then I discovered The Doors, and again, The Doors, you know, the guitarist um, from that band uses a slide very much as well, too. So having that kind of bluesy influence, but also combining poetry as well too as another one. Um, Nine Inch Nails is another one in terms of just the tenacity and the aggression and the deliverance with the, the, the vocals themselves. I mean, even Trent Reznor says, you know, sometimes it's not always quite on pitch, but it works in the context of it. So I like playing around with that. Obviously, I do want to stay on pitch in certain things, but playing around with notes for that. Radiohead is another one, um, just in terms of lyrical context and exposing that kind of vulnerability. Um, is another huge one. Tool is another one because Tool is very bass driven. It's very 
um, pulls a lot of its sonic qualities from um, indigenous sounds. So that's another reason why I very much like that band as well too. And, um, and the police as well too. Um, just Sting, you know, being able to be playing the bass and singing at the same time. And the drummer from that band is just incredible. And the guitarist as well too. And just, yeah, I could go on and on. <laughs> so I love a lot of different diversity of music. And Jerome brought up a very beautiful point about radio and I didn't necessarily have too much radio. I listened to it a bit in my junior and uh, senior year of high school purposefully just to have the radio experience. And then I had Pandora and et cetera, but I don't really do Spotify. I don't do any of those things. Not to say that there's anything wrong with that. I just don't. Um, but for me, just discovering music and having that diversity has been nice. My Both my parents, you know, very much introduced me to all kind of plethoras of different music. So, yeah. Is there anybody, uh, any bands that you know of that are currently touring today that you would say do um, a, a good job of experimentation and doing things that are um, kind of in the vein of what Morphine was doing in their, like throughout their career, obviously, but is there anybody that comes to mind that you are, are like, wow, these, like I, I really want to pay attention to this newer band or is that not necessarily? Well, I mean, minus ourselves, um, I would have to say uh, probably Radiohead in the sense of always, yeah, Radiohead is just definitely, every album sounds different. They still have a formula that they use, but they use different instrumentation like, you know, OK Computer was mainly acoustic with, you know, analog and digital together. Then they went to Kid A right afterwards, and that was all digital except for like one song. And we like to want to do that as well, too, is the project that we're working on with our album is combining analog and digital because of the time period that we're in. Just technologically, we have all these wonderful advancements with technology and composition, but I feel this pull, and I think a lot of people, too, who are musicians feel this pull back to, you know, a three-piece or a two-piece or just, you know, it's, you know, stringed instruments that are percussive, you know, and I think blending those two things are something that Radiohead does and what we're trying to do as well, too, so. Awesome. Dana, Jerome, is there anybody newer that you, um, that you are listening to that you're kind of intrigued by? And then we'll get to Jesse and Sigri's question as well with Mark. Uh, well, I, you know, my tastes kind of go all over the place. I, I, I'm often influenced by things that have happened a long time ago, or I'm just catching up with, you know, uh, like going back to like Fela Kute and, uh, you know, the Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopics and all that, uh, um, the, there's, there's some great stuff that came out of Beirut in the sixties and seventies and catching up with stuff that just, you know, where did this come from? Um, you know, a lot of like, uh, Tommy McCook on another vein for me sax as a saxophone player, that kind of more of a dub reggae feel. But um, I have bands like Tame Impala, I, I was pretty impressed with when I first heard them. Um, I've, I've really gotten into uh, um, uh, Warren's, Warren Haynes' uh, new stuff. He just did one with Nick uh, Cave and his uh, soundtrack for uh, Jesse, the assassination of Jesse James. That kind of stuff is just, uh, and he did this great soundtrack for uh, This Train I Ride, this amazing documentary on, on women young women who hitch trains uh, all across the country. Um, so, you know, influences are everywhere and still run deep into the archives. And what about you? Do you want to talk about your influences with drums? Yeah, I guess you could say I got sucked into music uh, through metal. <laughs> so pretty typical, I guess. Um, Metallica <laughs> was like my gateway band. But from there, I expanded pretty much anywhere that you could. Do you have a double kick drum? Hey, yeah, that was one of uh, the A drum or just a pedal? A pedal, I, sorry. See, uh, I used me to up. play double kicks to be like super pretentious and <laughs> have like a really big kit. Uh, look like but I you figured know. out all you needed was two pedals. You don't yeah. really need two drums. It's That's less you have I, to carry. I'm all right. about, yeah. Yeah, we Being got Being comfortable and pedal moving right here. as little as possible now. <laughs> yeah. good, good thinking. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut in. Go yeah, ahead. Okay. Oh, that's yeah. a good point. I'd say uh, for anybody who's looking for anything innovative, they should kind of dig in the underground and the not so popular stuff. Uh, I'm not really sure. At least I wouldn't say that anything on the radio is like really doing anything new. But with the internet now, like you can 
listen to anybody from all over the world. Yeah, that's There's the beauty of it. There's just like a yeah. gold mine of amazing talent, amazing music from all, like any genre you want, yeah. yeah. People mixing stuff, people, yeah. So, a lot of like the people that I follow that are doing like new things with music are all pretty uh, <laughs> underground, I guess. And I feel like that's actually where like a lot of the inspiration comes from for for new stuff, right? Like we're not, top 40 stuff isn't necessarily going to be showing you anything new. It's what people are used to and what people like, right? So if you're going into that underground stuff, that's where you're really going to find all of the good nuggets. Um, okay, I had, oh, uh, Sigri and Jesse had a question about, do, do you guys know maybe who Mark's influences were? Anybody that was, he was interested in particularly during the making of this album or was it just kind of was that known to you guys he had a pretty wide um catalog of stuff he listened to you know everything he could he'd go into a convenience store almost anywhere in the world and, and go to the you know the used section of cassettes and just randomly pull something out and he'd find something that would influence him uh but you know he had a wide taste for a lot of the stuff that I was got influenced was because of Mark, you know, his influence in uh, in a lot of the, the African stuff and the and the Ethiopian stuff of the '70s, and the, the kind of crossover that this, the Ethiopian music was 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 taking from what they were hearing in the U.S. and reinterpreting it. Uh, um, that that kind of crossover, I think, it was really interesting to Mark. Yeah, he um, he turned me on to uh, Hassan Hakmoun, uh, who plays the Sintir, um, which is a Moroccan uh, stringed instrument that sounds, you know, sort of similar to a slide bass. Um, so yeah, there's that, there's the Ethiopian funk stuff, there's, I'm listening to a bunch of stuff from Mali and, you know, different African sources. Um, you know, in terms of current stuff, I'm not really up on the latest pop stuff because I just haven't heard anything that's really grabbed my ear, but I don't seek it out. Um, you know, I still keep up with certain jazz artists. I'll buy anything that Bill Frizzell or, you know, Jack Dijonette puts out. Um, you know, Los Lobos for a, a current band, you know, big fan of theirs. But yeah, a lot of new, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff out there I might like, but I just don't I just don't seek it out. And most of the stuff on my phone is probably from at least a few years ago, if not a good deal more. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Let's uh, touch base on Morphine's um, sound and the sounds within the bands that have been put out. Um, a member of Art Hive, actually Dana, she had mentioned that uh, the bass within it kind of makes you feel like being in the womb. It's kind of like always there and kind of like a, uh, and I'm sure the right word for it, like an ethereal sound, but let's like, let's talk about these sounds that, that morphine is able to create specifically with just like this, uh, this nucleus that you're talking about, Dana. Um, tell me about kind of these, like the sounds that you're able to create and that, um, was there any push to make your sounds feel like something else? If that was, and I'm uh, not sure that was the right way to I say I didn't know it. where you were going to go with that, but that was, uh, th that was not what I was expecting. That, But there is some truth to that, I think. I, um, as a baritone saxophone player in a world of guitars, I, I was definitely trying to emulate what I was being, what I was hearing in terms of guitar playing, guitar work within a trio of a rock setting. So, um, I mean, other than my, my main influence for guitar would be Jimi Hendrix, of course, but the, the, the incredible um, capability of the guitar to to just emote and to explode and to, you know, have all of this sonic, you know, uh, palette was something that I that I really, really, really wished I could produce on a saxophone and tried really hard to do that. Like the sound of uh, Billy Gibbons guitar, you know, just that 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 just that dirt on that guitar string. I can just feel it and hear it in my head and there was something that resonated. So um, that was a huge uh, motivation for me to to try to emulate that as best I could within the saxophone. I did that answer that question. <laughs> yeah, I think so. 
Um, and I guess that leads me to another one. Is there any, um, are there any sounds that you do hear where you're like, I wonder if I could make that with my instrument, whether it's the saxophone or the drums or the bass, or when you're playing guitar soprano, is there anything where you're like, ooh, I want to try and like get that kind of a vibe, but on this particular instrument? Yeah, I think the number one thing that I try to see what I can do with this, because it's completely fretless, there is no fret action whatsoever. Everything that you're doing is with the slide and with the finesse of your hand. And just through listening to Cure for Pain and just figuring out the songs myself and watching, you know, other people like James um, was one of my friends and Dana's friend as well, too, and Jerome's um, and watching tutorials and things. Um, in short, I, I would once one sound that I really want to try to capture is a pinch harmonic, you know, because I like when guitars do that kind of squealy kind of thing. So still trying to figure out. I mean, I'm pretty satisfied with my tone overall, but with the distorted or the big muff or the fuzz, that dirt that Dana talks about, um, still trying to find a good balance between the clean and that as well, too, and, and also just see what I can do in terms of capturing the lower end as well too. Cause what was amazing about both Dana and Mark is they, you know, Dana, you know, makes sometimes his guitar, I mean, his, his saxophone sound. Hey, it worked. He called it, see it? Yeah, it sounds, I mean, it, the way the way that you, the way that you experiment with the different pedals that you use and et cetera is just ingenious. And going to Mark is, you know, using that um, micro synth that he had as well too. And just being able to make that sound dirty, but also very, digitized as well too so i just I, I love that as well too so being able to try to just blend all the three things that i just said together that's what i'm always trying to achieve because I, I never understood you know why guitarists are like oh they're always talking about their tone they're always like obsessed about their tone i never understood why but now that i have an amp and i have these pedals i'm like ah now i get why everybody's so obsessed with trying to find the sound that they hear in their head you know so you know and Dana or Jerome, is there anything that you like, anything that has in the past even where you're like, yeah, I want to try and make that sound with what I'm doing on my instrument? Or is that? I don't know. I'm always, I mean, I'm always struggling with drum sound just in general. I'm a pretty fastidious tuner and probably never quite satisfied with the way things sound. Um, but I don't think of, I mean, other than what I talked about before, sort of unconsciously trying to sound like a hand drum, um, I don't think about, oh yeah, I want to sound like this. Um, so yeah, don't don't really think in those terms. We've got a little over 10 minutes left and I want to definitely open this up to our audience if they have any questions, which I see some coming in now. But before we get to that, I do want to um, talk about Vapors. We've got a new album out from Dana, this is your other project, and so let's let's talk about that now. What are you doing now? And well, along with Jerome, uh, we have a we've after Mark passed away, we've uh, continued on as best we could. Uh, we've been through a couple of different uh, incarnations: Orchestra Morphine, Twineman, members of Morphine, and the one that most people are familiar with, the ever expanding Elastic Waistband which then became uh, Vapors of Morphine, and uh, which was a name that was given to us by someone who, uh, when they heard that their friend was coming to see members of Morphine play, and they said, oh, you're going to see that Vapors of Morphine band? As, in a way that was you know, thought to be pejorative, in a way that was a, a dig, because that was all that was left. And uh, it was Jerome, myself, and Jeremy Lyons playing at Atwoods. And when the person showed up, they this, these, were, these were when we had gigs. The person showed up and uh, a gig, look it up. It's in the history book somewhere, I don't know. Uh, they said they made the mention of it. And I think both Jeremy, Jerome, and myself just said, all right, that's our new name. And I think from that point on, we became Vapors of Morphine. Uh, we put out two records so far. Is that right, Jerome? Yeah, well, one was the first one was Ever Expanding Elastic Waistband, and then the second one was Vapors of Morphine, which was a new low. And then we have a, a, a no, uh, our newest one is coming out on Schnitzel Records, coming out on vinyl. It features Jerome Dupree on drums uh, on one side and Mr. Tom Airy on drums on the other side. And we love them both. We could not make a difference between the A and B side. So there's there is the one side and then there's the other side. So I'm not even sure who's on who. 
but um, we're we're really excited. We've we've taken 25 years to to record it and put it out there, and finally, it's coming in and uh, should be out this summer. Can't wait. In the spirit of record to record, can each of you, in a sentence, and this is going to be kind of a pain, I know, but um, talk about what the imprint of the album Cure for Pain has on the musical landscape. Um, Cipriano, how about I let you begin? I think for me, because um, what I liked about what I like about the '90s is it allowed um, lyricism to really lend to the emotive um, feeling, the soundscape of just feeling emotion. And I think for Cure for Pain for me just showed me now that I'm getting older um, that things will always be challenging, but there's comfort in just knowing that things will be okay eventually. You know, and I think Cure for Pain really conveys that kind of feeling for me because it goes from a party to reflection then to just being content again. You know, it just, that's, that, I don't think that was a sentence, but <laughs> that is really what it leaves for me every time I listen to it. Vitaly, do you have, do you have any thoughts on it? Uh, well, I crammed a bunch of morphine, uh, well, um, like their discography within the last like two months preparing for this interview because he's like the super big fan and he got me into it just like recently. So um, the one thing I guess I would say is I have like huge respect and admiration for anybody who can come up with a sound, like a vibe. Yeah. And that's not really something you really hear these days because everybody's kind of like copying everybody else. So I really appreciate um, just how morphine is distinct and unique. Jerome, how about you? Do you have any thoughts on maybe what this album specifically has to give? I don't know. I mean, for me, it's sort of a, a possibly the high water mark of my entire career. <laughs> um, you know, but uh, I mean, I'm just glad that people have heard it. I'm always, you know, when if someone comes up and says they were influenced by it, I'm just glad because I'm able to give back stuff that other musicians have given to me along the way. Um, just that inspiration and being able to connect. So, you know, if it's had an influence, I hope it's a good one. I would think that's fair. Look at all these people here. Uh, Dana, what about you? Well, I don't know. I think uh, when I listened to the record, I just listened to it again. It's been a while. I just put on this uh, Light in the Attic and I, uh, record that I had. It's a it's, a, it's like a, I don't know, limited edition. It has like a oh, Coke wow. bottle green, gla you know, color, coloring that which was uh, the, col the color of the jewel box for Ryko disc. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I could very easily think, wow, that's something we did. And uh, it's a limited edition vinyl copy that, that I, you know, I never thought anyone would be that interested to produce or to manufacture it's uh the record has stands on its own regardless of what we have to say about it it is its own entity in the world um and the more time i you know i'm away from it the more that is apparent to me in many ways i'm proud of the work we did i'm proud of my friends that i made the, the music with um, i'm particularly proud of jerome dupree's uh, work on this record it is a rosetta stone of drumming in my opinion and uh, there's, there's many players who were sprouted as a result of hearing his playing. And I feel, uh, you know, fortunate to have been in the, in the room with all these guys. And Paul Coldery's work, uh, all the people that were involved that, uh, that were a part of our community that, you know, allowed us to grow, our families. It's, you know, I'm not, I feel like I'm accepting an award, but it's, uh, uh, you know, everyone was involved and everyone has a, has a part in this and all the people who, who were moved by it and still are. So that's that's quite a great feeling to have. So thank you. Uh, Martin asking, Dana, when did you first try to two saxophones? Oh, good, I'm glad I don't have to type that in. For the life of me, I can never remember how to spell Rasan Roland Kirk. I have to look it up every time. But he was the man who uh, inspired Mark and me to have it, give it a try. And if you don't know who Rasan Roland Kirk is, check him out. Um, and uh, he played three uh, saxophones, two of which he had man he made that uh, allowed him to play multiple lines and he circular breathed and he was blind and he just an amazing performer and player. 
Um, and so I think Mark was influenced by that and said, hey, why don't you give that a try? And I said, yeah, okay, sure. And then he, he just kind of wrote around it, basically. He wrote songs around what, what I could do with the limitations of that particular arrangement. Is only, you, know, you can only use part of the instrument. You can't get a full range. You can only get a few notes on each one. So Mark had to devise a way to write a song to feature that. So, and I don't know when it was. It was probably, I don't know exactly what date. So, sorry, <laughs> a long time ago. A while ago. All right, another question. I'm always curious about whether or not musicians and other artists want their audience to understand their intent behind the art they create. Uh, yeah, for me, it is super important that people interpret it uh, the way that I portray it. And I'm, I feel like I might be in the minority with that. But um, yeah, the thing with our music, though, as I've come to learn, is that people hear it like way different than how we play it, which is super weird. And the reason we know that is because we like try out different people um, to see if they'd be a good fit to add to the project maybe, or to have a contribution. And the stuff that they come up with to fill that space that like we're talking about is like, like way out there. Yeah, that's very interesting to see that. Yeah, that's a good point. And for me, to answer that question in short, I just want a reaction, quite frankly. I think any kind of art, because for me, when I create art, is a form of expression, of course. But if you don't have some kind of reaction to it, I'm not doing my job. So you can be disgusted by it, you can not like it, you can like it. But um, if you you need to take something away from it. And if you don't, then I don't feel like I'm doing my job. So, mm. Dana or Jerome, what do you think? Do you, do you want people to understand what your intent was uh, after you release your music? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm just trying to play and make a good sound. And, you know, I mean, that's what I tell people if, you know, I usually introduce myself by mentioning morphine just because it's mainly the reason people know me as a drummer. But if someone hasn't heard it, I'll just say, just go listen to it. And yeah, you either like it or you won't, but it's not like, oh yeah, there's this great grunge thing I did back in the 90s. You know, there's something very timeless about it and that's just down to the genius of Mark Sandman. You know, you don't go in trying to make a record. You don't, I certainly wasn't thinking, oh yeah, this is one for the ages, you know, but kind of got that. So just feel very lucky, but uh, yeah, my intent is just to play well and, you know, try to be effective in the music. I don't know. I, I kind of, I think the mystery is nice. In fact, that, you know, that if people have their own interpretations, I think that's really more powerful. You know, obviously, I don't want to, uh, I want to respect the audience. I want to take the audience into account in terms of performance, but uh, beyond beyond that, um, I think it should be open to interpretation and that people should come away with their own personal uh, narratives that suits them. Cool. I'm glad that we got the full spectrum on that. And I don't think that anybody's in the minority there. That's, a, that's kind of a, an interesting one to think about. Sam asked, I get the sense that the band's genesis revolved around each member's work in live improvisational efforts, like in Hypnosonics. Would you say Cure for Pain's success changed that attitude in terms of having a touring life where fans expected a specific morphine sound and a rigid, familiar songs? Dean would have to answer that one. I didn't, I never toured except for uh, like a two week stint down to, down to Florida and back. Um, but to me, it was always the same, you know, to come back into it, even after all that time. I remember Mark was calling songs that, you know, hadn't played in five years or more, and we hadn't rehearsed, you know, and live on stage, he'd turn around and say, let's do this one. And I'd be like, sure, let's go. So there was always that element of it, you know, to be willing to go out on a limb and just have the confidence to pull something off. So for me, it was always the same. I, I think that's where the, the sound came from, the band sound. And Mark had an idea of what he wanted, and he was always working with uh, concepts and reworking concepts with different bands, different musicians. So he could throw something at you any at any time that you 
may have heard of, may not have heard of, but the idea was that whatever we're whatever we're we're going to do, we should be able to come to it with an original uh, approach each time. You know, even if you did know the song, you're still kind of wanting to bring something new to it. It is in this. It's very much the, in the spirit of of what uh, the motivation for our creating came from i think you know we didn't do a lot of talking about music we just we would get together and we would play and what came out got recorded and then we'd listen and would take our own notes probably and come back and 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 try to you know uh shine up the parts that were working and emit the stuff that wasn't and that's the, and to tail off on that dana that's why i love morphine so much and and use that approach in my own composition with this project as well too is I watch over and over so many different variations or live concerts or film stuff that you all did back in the day and it's never quite the same ever and I think the formula and the structure that you all did allowed it to do that and I think that's there's something so beautiful about that because it's like you say like I come from a performing arts and an actor background and when you do one performance you know you go back and the director gives you notes and then you do it again um, that's kind of how I approach, you know, playing the two string as well too. Cause I'm like, cause sometimes when you hit something wrong per se, it's like, oh, that actually works, you know, and then fitting that back into the composition. It's just wonderful. There's some live versions that you all did that I love the album versions, but even the, some of the live versions, I'm like, wow, I just, that's an awesome interpretation of that song. So. And when, when everything's in the key of D, there's, there's really not any, many mistakes you can make. So <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> I'll remember that. All right, and Jim was asking about lyrical influences. We know the the beats, but who else influenced the writing? If you guys can speak to that at all. Well, Mark's not here to answer that, but he was a voracious reader, and um, he loved words. He loved, uh, you know, word play. He loved um, word puzzles, and he kind of just uh, loved to distill language of all kinds. So I think lyrics came from his love of the word in different languages and his love of kind of playing with that and, and, and working on distilling it mostly. But, you know, writers that we you probably all have read and familiar with, Kerouac and Ginsberg and Berlin Getty and Elmore James and, you know, James Elroy and that, he liked that kind of stuff. All right, and well, since we know what Dana and Jerome are up to, Cipriano, do you have any releases coming out? We can't do live music just yet, but do you have anything planned for the next coming yeah, year? Um, just formulating and finalizing and trying to just come up with the best interpretation of the current work that we're working on. It currently is just called the Two String Project, trying to see who else we can bring in, looking for local musicians and possibly a saxophonist here as well, too, and maybe someone else. Um, for some from the, some of those songs, and also talk to Paul Coldery from um, the who produced um, Here for Pain as well too, and put on his radar what we're working on. So hopefully in the next couple of years things will be planning to maybe record next year and hopefully release something very soon. So. All right, we're going to keep an eye out for that. Well, this has been Record to Record from Art High. We will return next month talking with Denver's Tulips. We're going to be talking germ free adolescence by X Ray Specs. So make sure you sign up for that one. I am particularly jazzed for that. Thank you to my guests tonight, Cipriano Vitelli, Jerome, and Dana of Morphine. I am Bruce Trujillo. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you all thank you. so much. Thanks for everybody coming out. Yeah, thank you, Jerome and Dana. From the bottom of my heart, this has been a dream come true. No pun intended. <laughs> yeah, you guys are beasts. You guys are incredible. Well, thanks for putting it together. Appreciate it. Thanks for the support and the love.